Slip space ruptured detected. Yeah, we're picking up anomalies too. Are you reading Slip it? Slip space ruptured detected. Multiple covenant signals. Slip space ruptured detected. Slip space ruptured detected. They're everywhere. Slip space ruptured detected. The whole damn covenant Slip space ruptured detected. During their war against the UNSC, the Covenant steamrolled humanity, glassing world after world and especially dominating space combat. In general, due to the numerical and technological superiority of both the Covenant Empire and individual battle groups, to put things bluntly, the aliens usually kept things simple, moving in, smashing defenses, rarely retreating. The average Covenant cruiser was multiple times more powerful than its UNSC counterpart, while larger, more advanced vessels were in order of magnitude stronger, and they had more of them. Contributing to their blitzkrieg was advanced damage mitigation systems, and ships were more than willing to attack enemies bluntly even if it meant taking damage or losing lives. That being said, there was still a method to the Covenant Madness, and their general strategy was often dictated by their technological superiority. One major advantage was the sophistication of Covenant slip space drives, which allowed for faster and more precise jumps, including those within atmosphere, as seen during the Battle of Earth. Combined with far more advanced sensors and communication equipment, the Covenant were able to easily perform feints, sneak attacks, or traps. Shielding also provided a serious advantage for Covenant warships, though because shields needed to be dropped to fire energy weapons also represented a weakness. UNSC ships generally relied on overwhelming Covenant shields with many munitions. In response, the Covenant would cycle main targets, especially during Mach recharges. Nonetheless, to sum things up generally, unless the UNSC had an overwhelming numbers advantage, typically when attacking a planet, the Covenant fleet would simply move in, remove any defending fleet, land troops who would destroy any pockets of resistance on the ground and also recover artifacts or intel, after which glassing would be started, usually from orbit but sometimes rarely from within atmosphere. During the war, one of the only major threats to Covenant capital ships were orbital defensive platforms, supermax. The Covenant employed various tactics against Max. At the Battle of Earth, troops boarded the platforms themselves and deployed bombs. At other planets, including Reach, the Covenant targeted ground-based generators, and on other occasions, specialized long-range ships were used to minimize losses. However, speaking of boarding, the Covenant were known to board capital ships as well. During the events of Installation 04, Covenant ticks used the spots left by jettison escape pods to board the Pillar of Autumn. In response to this tactic, the UNSC developed the Cole Protocol, which stated that any ships facing imminent capture must wipe their computers and self-destruct. Besides for boarding actions, Covenant strike craft were typically launched from capital ships, then given a high degree of independence. Usually operated by elites looking for honor, fighters would often disengage from the fleet and attack targets without support. Arguably, this lack of cohesion is one of the major issues with Covenant naval tactics. However, because of the faction's overall power and the strength of their capital ships, that wasn't often exploited. Although, as I mentioned, tactics were pretty straightforward, Covenant fleets also also deployed in standard formations. Most commonly, ships were positioned in a line formation, with capital ships side by side. Often, larger vessels would be massed in the center of the line, while smaller ships provided support. A specific example of the line formation is the Golden Path tactic, which saw a CCS-class cruiser paired with two SDV corvettes. The ships would typically coordinate plasma lance and torpedo fire for deadly efficiency. As another example, two CCS cruisers together was known as a penitent battle group and represented overwhelming firepower. The Covenant also used oblique formations, a defensive pattern where ships were offset, and tri-formations, where trios of small fast ships were often used as a wedge to break apart enemy formations. On a macro level, Covenant ships were named based on their purpose and loadout, while fleets were similarly named based on their role. The Halo series so far has been set in the modern era of the universe, with the first three games taking place during the Human Covenant War, the tail end of that 27 year conflict, and the later set in the post-war period, but it's a galaxy where the past has also been filled with war? and where that history still heavily affects the modern times. 100,000 years before Halo Combat evolved, 
The galaxy was populated by several advanced races, one of them being the Forerunners. The Forerunners would enter a devastating war against a parasitic, all-consuming life form known as the Flood, and would be forced to activate their greatest superweapon, the Halo Rings. The Halo Rings would wipe out most life within the galaxy, including the Forerunners, and the galaxy would be reset essentially to a blank slate. The Forerunners would reseed the species of the galaxy, including humanity, and the last evidence of the Forerunners would be their great megastructures and technology, which could be found throughout the galaxy. Of course, I could do a whole video on the battle tactics, technology, weaponry, ships, etc. of the Forerunners, but I'll do so maybe on a different day. Fast forward to modern Halo and the Human Covenant War. And we have two dominant factions in the galaxy, Humanity, the UNSC, and the Covenant, an empire made up of several alien races. There were major differences in human and Covenant technology. The Covenant discovered many pieces of Forerunner technology, so their level of technological advancement was far beyond that of Humanity's. Humans, on the other hand, who had not been gifted Forerunner technology, were more creative and adaptable, but were light years behind the Covenant when it came to naval warfare tech. That being said, given that they existed in the universe, both the UNSC and the Covenant relied on one technology which formed the basis of interstellar warfare, slip space. When a ship or a message or a piece of information enters slip space, it's actually entering a portal between dimensions, which allows faster than light travel. Now, Covenant slip space drives, due to the fact that they were built off Forerunner technology, were significantly faster than human drives, giving them a serious tactical advantage. But that was far from the only advantage the Covenant had, Let's take a look at the ships of humanity, the UNSC, and the Covenant Empire. First of all, Covenant ships were protected by a sturdy energy shield. This shield could absorb energy weapons as well as projectiles and needed to be lowered for the Covenant to fire on an enemy, although this process was usually done extremely quickly such that it could be difficult for the UNSC to use this lowered shield to their advantage. Covenant ships used a variety of energy weapons which were usually very, very effective against UNSC armor. Often, Covenant ships would destroy human vessels in a single shot, but were also capable of surviving UNSC fire. Unsurprisingly, space battles were typically heavily slanted towards the Covenant, with the UNSC sometimes needing a 3 or 4 to 1 advantage to take down a single Covenant ship of similar tonnage. The most powerful Covenant weapons were large energy projectors or excavation beams, which could be used not only to cut apart enemy ships, but also to glass the surface of planets. Many of the larger Covenant vessels, and I'll talk about that in a minute, would possess one beam for the purpose of excavating with other secondary beams for ship-to-ship -ship combat. Smaller scale Covenant weaponry included pulse lasers for anti-fighter and anti-projectile duties, as well as magnetically guided and contained plasma, which were called plasma torpedoes. Humanity had very different technology. Ships during the war were not shielded. There was not a single completed UNSC ship which used any sort of energy shield. That would change after the war when humanity began reverse engineering Forerunner and Covenant technology and produced ships like the UNSC Infinity. Most UNSC ships instead were protected by very thick armor. Weapon-wise, many UNSC ships had one major feature, and that was the Magnetic Accelerator Cannon, frequently called the MAC. MAX accelerated a heavy projectile to extreme speed, smashing it through enemy vessels. This is a fairly similar idea to a railgun or coil gun. The destructive capability comes not from explosives, but rather the mass and velocity, i.e. the kinetic energy of the object. Many UNSC ships were arguably built around the MAC. It was the main offensive feature of the vessel, and MACs varied in size, from smaller versions built into UNSC frigates and destroyers to massive super MACs built into defensive platforms. Most ships had a standard single firing MAC. After firing the weapon, the MAC would need to be reloaded, although sometimes they could be fired at a partial charge. However, other ships like the Pillar of Autumn had a multi-firing system and other large vessels had double MACs or other exotic configurations. Being that the MAC was the main weapon of UNSC ships and UNSC fleets, tactics were often built around the firing of these weapons, as we'll discuss later. UNSC ships usually had secondary weapon systems, including Archer missiles, 
point defense guns, and even nuclear ordnance. When it comes to ship tonnage and classes, the Covenant almost always vastly outweighed and outgunned the UNSC. UNSC ships fell on several classes based on ship size and weaponry, with frigates being among the smallest ship class ordinarily in service, cruisers being the most common large ship, with there being very few higher tonnage ships, including the Epoch class heavy carrier, the Punic supercarrier, and the Infinity supercarrier. At the UNSC's height, there were probably no more than one or two dozen of these very large ships. By the end of the Human Covenant War, they were almost all destroyed, and they typically served as the flagships of very important fleets. In a prior video, I calculated that at the height of the Navy, the UNSC may have had about 2,000 ships, with a lot of those, of course, being small ships or even support vessels. The Covenant, on the other hand, possessed a lot more ships and a lot more powerful vessels. The Covenant Navy was, of course, also split up into classes. Like humanity, the smallest ships were corvettes and frigates, with the largest ships being the cruisers and carriers, and very rarely larger ships like supercarriers. Carriers, because of their size, shielding, and weaponry, were often capable of engaging entire UNSC fleets. The CAS-class assault carrier was over 5 kilometers long and could not only dominate in space, but also support entire ground invasions. One of the most common Covenant ships was the CCS-class battlecruiser, which held a clear advantage in pretty much every category against UNSC ships of similar class like the Marathon Cruiser. Within a ship type, there were sometimes different designs. These were known as patterns within the Covenant fleet. The CAS class, for example, had the Corel pattern and the Siphon pattern, among others. When it comes to tactics in Halo, starfighters play a less important role compared to some other universes like Star Wars. Usually because of the power of the weapons that each ship is using, the battle is over before starfighters can even get within range. Still, UNSC fighters would sometimes carry nuclear payloads or traditional missiles, whereas Covenant vessels would have small plasma weapons. The Covenant had such an advantage in space that typically their tactics weren't very complicated and relied on sheer aggression, with retreat for military purposes almost never being a viable option. Humanity, on the other hand, was much more pragmatic and built their tactics around their most powerful weapon, the Mac. And a lot of this came down to whether a UNSC Mac could be expected to one-shot a Covenant vessel. Something like an orbital defense platform could destroy almost every single ship with a single shot, whereas cruisers would not be able to destroy large Covenant ships in a single volley. Thus, in the case of fleet action, UNSC ships would frequently try to coordinate so that either one ship could take down a Covenant shield and the other ship could attack its hull directly with a Mac cannon or if the shield was too powerful, such that both ships could attack the shield at the same time, removing it, then following up with archer missile pods and other weapons. Firing the max, then following up with missiles or other weapons was something a single ship would typically do as well. The problem was, if a Covenant vessel could survive long enough to absorb the first Mac blast, it was unlikely that the human ship would have time to get off a real shot. When you read Halo books, the battles are often sort of described in these waves, just like this. During larger battles like the attack on Reach, the UNSC will fire, they'll sustain massive losses to the Covenant counterattack, then the remaining ships will fire again, resulting in battles that were frequently very, very short. When desperate, the UNSC would even use repair cradles and other manned ships to provide cover for their invaluable max. Both UNSC and Covenant ships made use of AI and electronic warfare, although human AI were much more advanced than their Covenant counterparts, and sometimes pulled off miraculous victories as we see with Cortana at the beginning of Halo CE. AI could do everything from calculating math during the battle, to aiming the ship, to playing music over the bridge, and whatever else was needed. And that's the basics of warfare in the Halo universe, at least during the Human Covenant War, where again the Covenant had a lot more ships, and each ship was far better. The tide changes a little bit in the post-war period, with the Covenant crumbling, with splinter factions forming, and with the UNSC also beginning to reverse-engineer technology and create their next generation of warships.
The UNSC Infinity is the most powerful modern starship in the Halo universe. Sure, a Forerunner Guardian or warship may give it a tough time and who knows what else remains of ancient advanced civilizations, but absolutely nothing made by humanity or the Covenant can stand up to the Infinity. Even a CSO class supercarrier would be stupid to try to take it on head to head. The Infinity itself is a game changer. Although originally designed under Project Ouroboro and intended as a a final lifeboat for humanity should Earth fall, the supercarrier has allowed the UNSC to dominate the splinter factions which formerly made up the Covenant. Now, just imagine, what if the UNSC had two of these monsters? Well, that was almost the case, and may in fact be in the future. Halo Warfleet reveals that humanity actually began work on two Infinity-class supercarriers, the Infinity itself, of course, and her sister ship, the Eternity. Now, unfortunately, no other source details the Eternity in any capacity, so we don't know how far in production the second ship went, whether it started work the same time as the Infinity, whether it has the same Forerunner enhancements, and just generally, whether it's a carbon copy or perhaps a slightly different ship within the same line. We do know, however, that parts for the Eternity were cannibalized to repair the active ship after it suffered various injuries. This all brings up several questions. Were the two ships meant to operate in tandem as two lifeboats for humanity, or or was the Eternity put into construction after the Infinity's successes? Was construction halted for some reason, or were the parts only borrowed because they were needed ASAP? If the former, what was made of the rest of the Eternity? If the latter, how much did the borrowing of parts put back the project, and when will it be finished? But the most interesting question is what kind of impact would a second Infinity-class supercarrier have on the Halo galaxy? Two Infinities would mean a second ship with four super mac grade cannons, an onboard force of assets and frigates capable of defending and taking any battlefield, and perhaps most interestingly, a second center for Spartan for training. The completion of this second ship would represent a massive jump in UNSC military strength, almost like when the Battlestar Galactica first encountered the Pegasus. However, regardless of the current status of the Eternity, we know that it probably won't be seeing action for at least some time. By 2550, the ship was still not finished. Also occurring in 2558, the re-emergence of the Guardians, which are now, under the command of Cortana, policing all populated worlds within the Orion Arm, subjugating the UNSC and the Covenant. The Eternity would have been an incredible asset, like the Infinity almost returning to its prior purpose as a lifeboat for humanity. The UNSC Infinity story is told in Halo Infinite largely through the prologue as well as various audio logs, especially the ones found at forward operating bases. The starting point is fairly simple. The UNSC, who were facing off against Cortana and the created, fashioned a tool which could be used to take down or if necessary delete Cortana, known as the weapon. The Infinity and its escort fleet traveled to Zeta Halo to deploy the weapon to retrieve Cortana if possible, and thus hopefully win against the Banished. As an aside, the UNSC Infinity was even more of an important ship at this point. The UNSC, as we learned throughout the campaign, was in tatters. Their headquarters at Sydney had been brutalized by a Guardian. Shipboard and station board AI were turning against themselves and scuttling their own vessels. So the Infinity was almost operating in its original role as a lifeboat for humanity. Anyway, the exact specifics of what happened when the Infinity arrived to Zeta Halo are a bit questionable. We know it was supposed to be Master Chief's mission to take the weapon down to Zeta Halo's surface, but it doesn't seem like that was the case. We see Chief get his ass beat by Atriox, so unless he made it down to the surface beforehand, which based on the audio logs doesn't seem to be the case, it's most likely that the weapon was brought to the surface by one of the other Spartans, where she stayed for six months as Chief was floating. Obviously, however, the mission did not go as planned, and that was because of the surprise appearance of the Banished. As we see in the prologue, the Infinity, upon approaching Zeta Halo, was ambushed by a handful of large banished ships. Estrom actually refers to these specifically as the banished dreadnoughts, so the ones you see flying over Zeta Halo. Several of these ships attacked the Infinity simultaneously from both sides, using their reinforced armor to ram the Infinity, which was probably a pretty unpleasant experience for the ship, but let's be honest, the Infinity had it coming. The Infinity wasn't alone either at the time of this attack. It was 
also being escorted by six Mulsane frigates, which were called the Advance Force. These two were most likely disabled or destroyed and can now be seen across the surface of the banished planet, including the UNSC warship graveyard and yeah advanced force does imply that there were more unsc frigates and i'm actually going to go out on a limb and guess that some of these are what we see in the multiplayer maps and we actually got some more details about the circumstances of the big team battle maps where we have the frigates in today's cannon fodder we also learned that the ships use what's known as a bright lance reflex laser not, as I assumed, a Forerunner Enhanced Mac. Anyway, back to the battle, it's revealed in both the prologues and the audio logs that the Infinity was not only attacked by the ships, but was also boarded en masse. The Spartans on board, including Master Chief and the Spartan Force, did their best to defend the ship, but in the end, Captain Lasky gave the order to abandon the ship. Now, presumably Captain Lasky is okay. The audio logs actually deal largely with getting him to a lifeboat. I'm also going to assume that Hull and others on board probably made it to safety. This is definitely sort of a Halo CE type of situation where now they're stranded on the ring and the survivors are having to try to regroup and whatnot. This time, however, you're starting to play six months after the event. My main gripes related to the CSO class supercarrier relate not to its power or its design from an in-universe standpoint, but just the fact that this ship is almost unbelievably lazy and stupid. But first, let's talk basics, and I'll give you guys a brief overview of the Covenant's largest and most powerful capital ship. The CSO class supercarrier is ginormous, almost 29 kilometers, which is a superstar destroyer and a half plus a little bit extra. It was the largest of the true Covenant capital ships, although smaller than some space stations like of course High Charity or the Unyielding Hierophant, and was armed to the absolute teeth with energy projectors and the other standard Covenant weaponry that you would expect on a large supercarrier. Because of its weaponry and carrying capacity, it was essentially an entire army and navy in and of itself. And one of these ships even, the Long Night of Solus, was dispatched to Reach in 2552, where it was surely meant to be a key part of the invasion. That ship was destroyed during Operation Uppercut with a modified slip space bomb, albeit at the cost of Spartan George's death. Before its destruction, the Long Night of Solace was seen as an existential threat to planet Reach. It was pounding away non-stop at the planet's surface, it was the main staging point for the invasion, it was refueling the other elements of the advanced fleet, and just basically represented the bulk of the Covenant's assets. George died thinking that the destruction of the CSO class supercarrier would save Reach. Unfortunately, the fleet of particular justice arrived right after it was destroyed and further subjugated the planet. So that all sounds pretty cool. What do I have against this ship? Well, my main problem is that the CSO supercarrier is just really dumb and really, really lazy. I'm okay with each faction having a ship or a few ships that are radically more powerful than the standard elements of their navy. We have the Super Star Destroyers in Star Wars being an obvious comparison. So it's really not that element of the supercarrier that bothers me. It's that the upsizing is made in a way that's just totally uninteresting and in a way that has no thought put to it. First of all, if you're going to make a mighty dreadnought for your new navy, it should at least be interesting. This is the most powerful ship at your disposal. From a viewer's perspective, you want it to be unique, you want it to be frightening, you want it to be instantly recognizable that this ship is incredibly powerful. I'm sorry for making so many Star Wars comparisons, but when the Executor is seen on screen for example, we have it eclipsing a symbol of the Empire, the Star Destroyer. What's more, the design is instantly recognizable. Although the SSD shares some common similarities with the Star Destroyer, particularly its general shape, it's obviously different, and you can tell it's different from any angle. The CSO, however, is the exact same as the CAS class, except just much larger and a different color. In fact, the asset in Halo Reach is simply a recolor of the Halo 3 asset. That game doesn't really distinguish between the two ship types. 
Belainth was only given in a later secondary source book, so some have assumed that the ship was upsized in scale to make George's sacrifice ultimately be more important, and I think that that's definitely a possibility. But there's also a bit of weirdness when you just upsize a ship, if that is true. For example, everything on the CAS is upsized, including things like windows. So presumably the ship is now crewed by a very, very tall Covenant. Similarly, you have much, much more volume when it comes to transport and storage, and you have a lot more hangar space, but no additional hangar openings. I mean, the heart of this issue is the fact that the ship serves as a set piece, then later lore went in and gave some extra details, but I don't think it was done in a way that makes a whole lot of sense. But to sort of sum up my ideas on this particular topic, my point is that when you're making a monster flagship for your faction, it shouldn't just be an upsized version of an already existing ship. For one, it's hard to tell the difference, and you want your scariest ship to be unique, but it's also nonsensical, and you're wasting the opportunity to design something that's really, really cool. Also, looking at things from a Covenant point of view, I just don't see what the purpose of the CSO is. I mean, what can that ship do better than five CASs? I mean, yes, it can carry all the material to wage a war on a single planet, but surely it's not any cheaper to make these things than making five carriers, which also have the added benefit of being able to attack multiple places at once. Obviously, Covenant Society is based very heavily on honor, so I would expect the largest capital ships like this to be led by the highest of the profits, but that's not what we see here. To me, this is a ship without any real purpose, which has probably suffered from some retcons, and that's likely why the CSO doesn't really appear in Halo lore besides for Halo Reach itself. The subline Transcendence is mentioned as another Covenant supercarrier, but the only real appearance in the Reach form is the Long Night of Solace. And I think it's basically been punished for being just really stupid. I know a lot of you guys do like this ship because it's so powerful, but look at it from a practical perspective. There are some people who hate this ship as much as I do, and one person in particular who hates it much more, and that's my friend Unikraken, who's lead dev on the Sins of the Prophets mod. And I asked him for a quote, and well, he delivered. I want to share with you guys some key points. The CSO is an absurdity at every level of its design. He states that people always ask him to put it into the mod, but every time we come to the same conclusion, the ship is too absurd to use in a way that would rationally translate to anything viable for a strategy game. The most glaring absurdity is that the ship is clearly just an upscaled assault carrier. The ship's model was ported from Halo 3 with all its imperfections and features into Halo Reach, then recolored to be more purple. Every visual feature on the ship's surface is upscaled as well, including her lights and windows. The ship, larger than many known moons, is cloaked for two weeks above reach, one of the UNSC's most important and busy military hubs surrounded by a full network of the most powerful orbital weapons the UNSC can field. When we spoke with the ship experts at 343, who obviously inherited this piece of lore from Bungie's time, they seemed equally flabbergasted about the ship and agreed that it seemed to be a poor choice. They noted that the ship was more akin to a battle station and would be vulnerable to coordinated attacks by many smaller vessels. Once the ship's shields were compromised at all, it could be destroyed fairly quickly with salvos of nuclear strikes. It would be unwieldy to maneuver in direct combat and would depend on a fleet for defense. As a note, he states something that I wanted to talk about in this video perfectly, which is basically that a ship of this size is touted for its ability to basically conquer a planet on its own, but is almost completely unwieldy. He finishes by saying a curious note on the game development side is that the assault carriers you see exit slipspace immediately after the CSO's destruction are a new model of the CAS created entirely for Halo Reach. And and they featured a new modeled hull design with key difference from the two previously seen assault carriers in 2 and 3. He finishes by saying that pattern has yet to be named, but can be fielded by players in our mod, Sins of the Prophets. So Before super ships like the Infinity entered service, there were very few UNSC vessels which could stand up to a Covenant cruiser in a direct engagement. The most powerful ship type within this very elite group was the Punic class supercarrier. Before and during the Human Covenant War, the Punic was humanity's ultimate capital ship, 
we'll break it down today. As a note, some of the images and content in today's video comes from the amazing mod Sins of the Prophets. Now, technically their rendition of the Punic is not canon, and we only have one official image of the ship, but I think the Sins version is well thought out. Also put a link to the mod down in the description. At around 4 kilometers long, the Punic was 4 times longer than a Marathon or Halcyon cruiser, while also being remarkably thick. The Punic's main offensive tool was a pair of high-powered Max. According to Meet the Big Hitters, an article on Spartan Games which you can only view through Internet Archive, the Punic class is fitted with two Super Max, which can be fired into the four arc independently or combined, so will be tied any enemy vessel in front of this attack as a whole lot of pain is headed their way. Generally, the power of a magnetic accelerator cannon is scaled up depending on the platform carrying it. The Punic is 4 kilometers long, and before the Infinity, the largest UNSC warship. The gun would thus be significantly more powerful than the Mac on a cruiser and the most powerful ship-based Mac during the war. Additionally, the Super Prefix is only used on the Punic, orbital defense platforms, and the Infinity, so the ship is keeping good company. Speaking of the Infinity, there are multiple ways the Punic clearly inspired the latter vessel's design. Like the Infinity, it had secondary mini-max alongside missiles and other traditional guns spread across the ship. Interestingly, the Punic also carried underslung frigates or corvettes, though we don't know how many. This allowed it to deploy an escort fleet anywhere in the galaxy. In addition, the Punic would have carried a large complement of fighters and support ships. The main way the Punic falls behind the Infinity is pure technology. The supercarrier entered service before the Human Covenant War, and lacks a precise slip space drive shielding, advanced sensors, and upgraded Series 8 Mac of the Infinity. The history of the Punic, speaking of, is nicely summarized on another archived Spartan Games page. The Punic, lead ship of the line, and its sister ships were created at the end of the 25th century by the Colonial Military Authority, a precursor to the UNSC. They were used against insurrectionists and later the Covenant. The best known Punic was the Trafalgar, the center of Reach's defense fleet, which was destroyed as the planet fell. Other Punics saw action during the destruction of Estuary and the evacuation of Charbatus 9. A single Punic, due to its immense strength and its almost unique ability to stand up in one-on-one -on -one engagements to Covenant capital ships, was an incredibly important asset. Meet the Big Hitters has the following quote, Unfortunately, the destruction of each supercarrier also means an irreplaceable loss of the elite crews and material that slowly erodes the UNSC's overall effectiveness. By 2552, only a handful of Punics remain spaceworthy. Given the fact that there is no evidence of supercarriers present at the Battle of Earth, I find it quite likely that the class was fully wiped out by the final blitzes of the Covenant in 2552. Due to the serious advancements in technology by the end of the Human Covenant War, it's unlikely that the UNSC would ever create more Punics, but they still have a special place in history as the largest and most powerful war and pre-war ship of humanity. For billions of humans, the massive sloping hull of a Covenant assault carrier was the final thing they'd ever see. Whether launching thousands of fighters or transports to the surface of occupied worlds, or unleashing holy cleansing beams, the CIS was a pure force of destruction. As with many Covenant ships, there were several different subtypes or patterns for the CAS class assault carrier but the differences were relatively minor, and mostly related to the cityscape-style superstructure, or lack thereof, on the dorsal hull. The CAS was one of the largest Covenant warships in service, over 5 kilometers long and too wide. Although not as long as the UNSC Infinity, the sheer mass of the CIS gives it twice the volume. As the name would suggest, the assault carrier was a well-balanced mix of destructive power and asset carrying. Let's talk about the former. The S in CAS stands for salvation, which means the ship has at least one energy projector. In reality, the assault carrier uses multiple, one massive dedicated dorsal excavation beam, two plasma lances, which are primarily anti-capital ship weapons, and up to eight secondary plasma emitters. All 11 plus guns are essentially highly accurate long range beam weapons, which can tear apart even the most powerful wartime UNSC capital ship in mere seconds. The excavation beam would have been the primary glassing tool of the CAS, though all energy projectors can perform secondary glassing duties. In addition, as with most Covenant capital ships, the CAS would have used plasma torpedoes, 
for secondary offensive duties and pulse lasers for point defense. Alongside its incredible weapons, the CAS was able to single-handedly occupy enemy worlds, carrying not only tens of thousands of warriors, but every starfighter, vehicle, or asset type possibly needed. As we see in Halo 3, the CAS's hangar was so massive that smaller capital ships could fit inside the carrier without any issue. All of this was powered by advanced nuclear fusion reactors, which provided among other things thrust to the assault carrier's three engines and energy to the vessel's slipspace drive and incredibly durable shield. Assault carriers were almost impossible to kill, especially without the use of super Mac platforms or high yield nuclear bombs. For this reason, as well as the mix of power and asset carrying that I've been mentioning throughout the video, CASs were often used as flagships for profits or as the center of large covenant fleets. Further increasing survivability is the fact that the fore of the ship could detach in emergencies or in cases where the rear of the vessel had been seriously damaged. Both modules could operate independently and likely travel through slip space. Alongside that, vital portions of the ship were protected and placed within the center of the vessel. One notable weakness, however, is the narrow neck, which connects the head and the command superstructure to the ship's main body. A fleet of perhaps over 100 assault carriers protected high charity at all times. Besides for that, these ships were a part in almost every major offensive and battle of the Human Covenant War. The Day of Jubilation and Solemn Penance led a small fleet which broke through Earth's defenses. The Shadow of Intent was the flagship of the Fleet of Retribution and served majorly within the Swords of Sanghelios. Covenant splinter factions after the war, including Jewel Undama's Covenant and the Banish, continued to make use of these vessels. And, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, hundreds of UNSC colonies and thousands of ships fell to the glassing beams of CAS carriers. That being said, the overall galaxy-wide supply of the assault carrier was diminished significantly by the Covenant Schism and especially the early battles around High Charity. It should also be noted that the Covenant made use of an upsized version of the CAS known as the CSO class supercarrier. The CSO, which was the most powerful and largest Covenant warship, was over 28 kilometers long, and by the Battle of Reach, perhaps eclipsed all UNSC forces single-handedly in terms of raw power. Despite its relatively short re-emergence in the Human Covenant War, the Pillar of Autumn is arguably the most important ship in the history of humanity. Not only that, the Pillar of Autumn was an absolutely fantastic weapon against the Covenant. Today, we'll be breaking down why that ship was so effective. But before we do that, it's useful to understand the general principles and mechanics and strategies and realities of the Human Covenant War. First of all, humanity had virtually no chance in space. Humans could only reliably beat the Covenant when they had a ship advantage of 3 to 1, and even with that scenario, they would still typically take very heavy losses. The Covenant would sometimes describe humanity as winning their few battles by drowning the Covenant in human blood. Humanity really had two to three main disadvantages. First of all, Covenant slip space jumps were much more precise and they were faster. The Covenant could do micro jumps within system, and that gave them a huge tactical advantage. Covenant ships also were fully shielded, with most Covenant vessels able to even take a Mac round from a cruiser class ship or smaller. Additionally, Covenant ships could usually inflict a fatal blow on a UNSC vessel with a single volley or single firing of its main gun, whether that's plasma torpedoes or something like a plasma beam. Human ships had more, well, I guess from our perspective, traditional weapons. The most powerful weapon on most UNSC vessels vessels was the magnetic accelerator cannon, the MAC, which accelerated an object to very fast speeds, basically pounding through the enemy. MACs typically would fire around, then they would recharge, and usually humans would pair that with missiles, nukes, sometimes autocannons, and whatever else. The problem for humanity is that they would fire their MACs, and often the Covenant ship would either absorb the round with their shields, or they would take a shot but not go down. Now, there were ways to counter this, for example, during 
during fleet actions, UNSC fleets would often fire their Mac rounds and waves, so the first set of shots would aim to take the Covenant ships down, the second shot's then aiming to destroy the ship as the shields are down and the first shooters are recharging. But even with that strategy, humanity was always very, very vulnerable because a single shot, as I mentioned, from a Covenant ship could destroy a UNSC vessel. So, how does this relate to the Pillar of Autumn? Well, the Pillar of Autumn was a Halcyon class cruiser. Halcyons were actually pre-war ships which had been largely mothballed before the Human Covenant War. They had seriously worse reactors compared to the newer Marathon class which replaced them and they were just generally seen as inefficient. However, the Halcyon also came with certain advantages. First of all was the hull structure. This was probably the main thing that made the Pillar of Autumn and other Halcyons stand out. I'll explain more of this in a second but it was actually this redundancy in these protective measures which led to Cortana choosing the Pillar of Autumn as the ship which would ferry her and John off of Reach. Because yeah, not only did Cortana pick John as her Spartan, she also chose the Pillar of Autumn, at least if you go by the lore from the Fall of Reach. It's a little bit different now that the video game has changed things. Either way, I think her analysis is still interesting. This is what she says. The Pillar of Autumn is 43 years old, Cortana said. Halcyon class ships were the smallest vessels ever to receive the cruiser designation. It is approximately one third the tonnage of the Marathon class cruiser. Halcyons were pulled from long term storage. They were designated to be scrapped, in fact. The only noteworthy design feature of this ship is the frame. Cortana reached down and pulled off the skin of the holographic model as if it were a glove. The structural system was designed by Dr. Robert McLeese, founder of the Ray's McLeese shipyards over Mars in 2510. It was, at the time, deemed unnecessarily overmassed and costly due to a series of cross bracings and interstitial honeycombs. The design was subsequently dropped from all further production models. Halcyon class ships, however, have a reputation for being virtually indestructible. Reports indicate these ships being operational even after sustaining breaches to all compartments and losing 90% of their armor. So, the Halcyon helps make up for the fact that UNSC ships do not possess energy shielding because it can take even what would be a devastating crippling shot on another ship and continue chugging along because of the way the ship is designed. With sections generally being supported from multiple points, the ship could take immense structural damage but still maintain its overall integrity. And yeah, the Pillar of Autumn takes a beating. You don't recognize this in the game, but by the time the Autumn flees Reach, it had single-handedly destroyed a Covenant supercruiser which had been devastating the UNSC fleet from afar, seriously helping to bolster Reach's defensive effort. However, in that moment, and subsequently, the Pillar of Autumn took serious damage, and by the time it arrived at Installation 04, the ship was a shadow of its former self. Two of the reactors had been fully destroyed, while the third was repaired and still functional. The Mac had been depolarized and was thus unfunctional. Several decks were completely destroyed, but even with all of that said, upon emerging at Installation 04, Cortana in the Pillar of Autumn managed to destroy four Covenant cruisers. But yeah, the Pillar of Autumn's durability is incredible. It takes all of that damage before jumping to Installation 04, it battles it out with Covenant cruisers before crashing to the surface of the ring and is still somewhat functional. The Autumn was special not only because of its defensive prowess, but because of its major refit, including several state-of-the-art systems. After Cortana had selected the Autumn as the ship which would help her and Master Chief carry out Operation Red Flag, which was meant to be a desperate attack against Covenant leadership, the Autumn was substantially refit. The Fall of Reach covers these refits extensively, I'll give a brief breakdown here, but the most notable upgrade was the reactor system, which which used cutting edge science to keep the reactor cool and highly efficient, even as it outputted extreme amounts of energy. But it was not only one reactor, it was in fact three, and if all three were supercharged at the same time, they could temporarily boost the ship's overall power by 300%, with the Autumn being the first ship to get this, as I said, state-of-the-art reactor. The generator also allowed for a new Mac system, and instead of firing one projectile, 
the Pillar of Autumn's Mac would actually fire three in succession with a single Mac charge. So the first or maybe second shot would take down the Covenant shields with the third delivering an incapacitating punch in combination with other munitions like missiles. Alongside that, the Pillar of Autumn also made use of point defense turrets and the other traditional weapons you would expect on a UNSC ship. Additionally, the Pillar of Autumn had significant storage space and as we see during the events of Halo CE and Halo the Flood, enough of a marine slash ODST contingent, including a drop pod launcher from the ship itself, to maintain a lengthy ground invasion, complete with support aircraft and ground vehicles. Arguably though, the Pillar of Autumn's greatest asset was its leadership. Not only Cortana, who was directly integrated with the ship's systems for most of the time, but also the Pillar of Autumn's secondary dumb AI, and of course, Captain Keys. Captain Keys had already proven his tactical genius at the Battle of Sigma Octanus, but he also brought a veteran bridge crew to the Autumn and worked really well with Cortana. Keys was willing to give Cortana control of the ship if it would benefit their overall fight, and Cortana was arguably the best and most advanced AI ever created by humanity. She would use the ship's lateral emergency thrusters to dodge Covenant capital ship shots. She would monitor the bridge crew and bring their efficiency past standard levels through psychological tactics and just generally was a master of everything related to the Pillar of Autumn. We'll also mention that electronic warfare was one area where humanity outshined the Covenant and with Cortana on the Pillar of Autumn's computers, you're giving yourself an advantage in that department as well. So when you take the ship's defensive abilities, its new state-of-the-art reactor and MAC system brought on by the refit, then you take the leadership, the fact that John 117 is helping to protect the Pillar of Autumn on the ship, and of course the sizable marine contingent and the associated armor, you can see why this vessel is one of the most famous in UNSC history. And of course, the Pillar of Autumn would actually go on to inspire a new line of cruisers after the Human Covenant War, with the Autumn class being named after the Pillar of Autumn, replacing the Marathon class cruiser as humanity's post-war UNSC mainline ship. The last thing you might be wondering is, well, if the Autumn's so great, how come it wasn't used before the war? How come the UNSC decided to replace it with the Marathon class? Well, the UNSC wasn't fighting the Covenant when they made that decision, and as mentioned by Cortana, the Pillar of Autumn was seen as needlessly durable. It's most likely that a Mac cannon would make most of those defensive features unnecessary or unhelpful as it's blasting the ship apart. But but whereas the Covenant sort of take things apart piece by piece with their plasma weapons, then the honeycomb structure becomes more effective. Plus there's the fact that the Pillar of Autumn and Halcyons generally were just using worse generator technology, and it's the refit which really brought the Pillar of Autumn into the modern age and made it humanity's greatest capital ship. I'm just gonna say it, at least until the UNSC Infinity. Anyway, I was doing some research for another video and I found something really interesting. A data pad from Halo Reach, which I had seen before, but hadn't realized actually gives us a way to quite reasonably estimate how many ships humanity had at the beginning of the Human Covenant War, or at least in 2526, and it's written from the perspective of the Assembly, which is sort of a group of human AI working together for the betterment of humanity, sort of from the shadows, and they only really appeared in the Reach data pads. Anyway, data pad 10 takes place after the Covenant attack on on Biko, and the AI are evaluating the Covenant's ability to glass an entire world. Now ultimately, whether they're right or not isn't important. What is important is they evaluate their ability to do so based on UNSC war assets. Now here's the specific quote. Earth, one of the smaller planets inhabited by our creators, has 130 billion acres of surface area. Thus, assuming the Covenant possesses a number of ships equal to that of the UNSC, and that part is key, and assuming that all of those ships are capable of generating and discharging the required power non-stop for the duration of the process, it would necessitate the combined efforts of their ships in total for a minimum of 30.3801 years to glass the entire surface of Earth. 
And important to this, earlier they had actually given us the rate for covenant glassing, which is one acre for 15 seconds of sustained fire. So, and we're going into algebra a little bit, they give us everything they need to figure out the key variable, how many ships they're talking about. Now, whether these numbers are right isn't important, because we're not looking at the truth of the statement, we're looking at the actual mathematics itself. So, the equation is total glassing time equals the rate of glassing times the area being glassed divided by the number of ships. So they say that Earth has a surface area of 130 billion acres. Now that is a round number and a bit of an estimate, but that doesn't really matter. Because as long as it's the number they used within their arithmetic, the math will be functional. So 130 billion acres, multiply that by the rate of glassing, or in other words, the time it takes to glass one acre, which is 15 seconds, and we get a total glassing time of 61,700 193.091 years. So, in other words, that's the amount of total work that needs to be done to glass the planet. 61,000 years of glassing at 15 seconds per acre. Now, if that's all we had, we'd be stuck. And I know some of you at this point have already figured it out, but not all of us have practiced math recently. Anyway, the AI finished the equation to get their number of years by slotting in the total amount of UNSC active war ships and assuming that they all discharge this power non-stop and basically uniformly. With that slotted in, they got the total number of 30.31 years. So with all the combined vessels, that number of 61,000 gets taken down to 30 years. Now if we arrange that equation to now solve for total UNSC ships, we get 2,033 with some numbers after the decimal. And it's actually much closer to 2,034. Not only is it much closer, Closer, but it's close enough that any extra passed to zero, and of course you can't really have a bit of a ship when we're talking in these sort of generalities, can be written off to significant figures and just rounding errors. So basically what I'm saying is at this point in 2526, the UNSC had 2034 warships. Now, given that many of these would have been very small, and humanity at this point would have had hundreds of planets, I think this actually makes a lot of sense, and is really close to the number that I had in my head. We also know that various Covenant fleets at certain points had hundreds of ships, and the ones surrounding High Charity may have even had thousands, so I think that number is also in keeping with the spirit of Halo, which has humanity absolutely outgunned by the Covenant. Now, I do want to say, although I didn't find this number or this calculation anywhere, I was researching this topic for another video and reading the data pad. When I searched UNSC and the number, I did see other references to 2033 especially on various boards and forums, so I'm absolutely not the first person to make this calculation. Another thing to note is this is the starting point, or at least as I said, as the UNSC existed in 2526. There would have been ongoing shipbuilding during the war, and this may not include ships not under the control of the UNSC, for example, that the various any factions would have used, and those could have been later procured. Regardless, I always get the feeling when I play Halo 2 and Halo 3 that at that point in the timeline, humanity has maybe a few dozen vessels left which would put total UNSC ship losses in the multiple thousands, which again, I think makes sense. Now, in reality, there were actually several frigate classes used by the UNSC. During the war, there was the Charon class, the Paris class, and the Stalwart class. Then after the war, humanity also created two advanced frigate classes called the Strident and the Anlace. We're going to be talking more about the wartime frigates of the UNSC for today's video, i.e. the Charon, Paris, and Stalwart, because they're far more relevant to the overall story, with the UNSC in Amberclad and Forward Unto Dawn being stalwart and Charon class frigates respectively, but also because, to be fair to humanity, they did rectify some of the issues with the frigate class as a whole that we'll be discussing today. Regarding the differences between the specific classes, I don't necessarily think that's super important to go into for today's video. They're all sort of permutations of the same design. The Paris class is the heaviest of the UNSC frigate types, the Charon was made more more for ground support.
support, and the stalwart seem to be a mix of both. And the Paris, by the way, is actually significantly larger than the other frigate types, but I think we can just sort of lump them all together and discuss them like that. So the question of were UNSC frigates bad is a tough one. Were they bad for their originally designed roles? Maybe not, but these ships really, really suffered during the Human Covenant War. Ideally, UNSC frigates would be escorts for much larger vessels, marathons and above. That way they can provide extra fire support and their thin armor compared to larger capital ships doesn't need to take as much direct fire because there are more important targets, obviously. However, because of how the war was going for humanity, a lot of times single or packs of frigates were forced to engage the Covenant and that almost always went extraordinarily badly for the UNSC. Even the Paris, which is the heaviest frigate again, is relatively lightly armed compared to a true UNSC cruiser. For comparison, the Paris is 535 meters long, it uses 60 centimeter thick battle plating, while the Marathon, which is closer to a true battleship, is 1200 meters long and has almost two 200 centimeter thick battle plating. So practically during warfare, that is a knock against the UNSC frigate. There's no Covenant ship, literally none larger than a drop ship that this thing has a chance of beating in single combat. Its general design also makes it particularly vulnerable when other larger ships aren't soaking up the fire. That's because UNSC frigates were based on the idea that these are essentially fast moving weapons platforms. They have relatively light max compared to larger ships, max being magnetic accelerator cannons and have thinner armor. So ideally you want these things contributing fire to an enemy while not taking shots themselves. This was actually one general weakness of UNSC's strategy. They were built around knocking out their enemy. Max put out a lot of damage but then had to recharge. The UNSC struggled against the Covenant because their large capital ships could absorb the first round and then hit back against the UNSC with plasma weapons which were almost always fatal with a single blow. So yeah, in a lot of space battles against the Covenant, frigates just got slagged really easily, and not only that, but the Covenant would take out entire swaths of them. That being said, when it comes to overall design, unlike something like a Star Destroyer, which even in universe you can pick holes with, I do think UNSC frigates are well-made ships. There's a real economy of design here. Every aspect of the ship has purpose. The frigate is dominated by twin boons. The top one is used for fire control, computing systems, and more and more, while the lower boon houses most of the Mac itself. When you look at Halo Warfleet and when we talk about something especially like the Paris, you can tell that every inch of the ship is built around the magnetic accelerator cannon, which makes sense. Again, these are supposed to be very light ships which can contribute Mac fire. So where you can put extra, say, reactor capacity or whatever else to recharge the Mac quicker, that's basically what's being done to the expense of other things like extra armor or redundant systems. UNSC frigates were also covered with anti-ship weapons, whether that's archer missiles or anti-fighter weapons, and really the true configurability came depending on the ship class. Paris class frigates used any additional space usually to house long swords to help during space combat. Charons, like the Forward Unto Dawn, obviously had those very large troop deployment bays, and the Stalwart probably had a mix of the two. I actually really like how the UNSC takes one design and makes three different permutations. By the end of the it does put humanity in a bit of a tough spot, like I think at the Ark the humans would have rather have a Paris class than a Charon class, but to be honest either one will get slagged by a Covenant warship that feels like giving it any attention. So I guess it is what it is. One of my other problems with frigates is that the UNSC in my opinion overused them compared to the Destroyer, which in most situations seems like a superior ship. The Destroyer's main downside is that it lacks some of the pure maneuverability and speed of a frigate, but seems to be pretty fast in its own right, at least according to Commander Keys, who I think knows his stuff. According to the fall of Reach, and I quote, unlike the frigates that Commander Keys had toured before, the Meriwether Lewis and Midsummer Night, the frigate was a destroyer. She was almost as heavy as both these vessels combined, but was only seven meters longer. Some in the fleet thought the massive ships were unwieldy, too slow and cumbersome. What those critics forgot was that a UNSC destroyer sported two Mac guns, 26 oversized Archer missiles, 
missile pods and three nuclear warheads. Unlike other fleet ships, she carried no single fighters. Instead, her extra mass came from nearly two meters of Titanium A battle plate armor that covered her from stem to stern. The Iroquois could dish out and take a tremendous amount of punishment. I think Halo War Fleet says it quite well. These vessels lack the sort of multi-purpose utility of some frigates, but make up for it with cruiser level armor and nearly cruiser level firepower. If I'm in the unfortunate situation where I have to take on a Covenant ship head to head, I'm choosing a destroyer 10 times out of 10. Other than that, generally when talking about frigates, I mean there were some small quips that I would make. For example, UNSE ships as a whole, not just the frigate class, had the bridge in the most obvious place. Halo Warfleet says that this is a sort of callback to traditional naval history, but we're fighting space battles now. Put the bridge inside of the ship, use cameras and whatnot. If you're relying on your actual visual sight in the Halo universe, you're dead anyway. Covenant ships did this, and I think it was very, very smart. The Human Covenant War absolutely devastated the UNSC Navy. Hundreds, or perhaps thousands of ships, were whittled down to mere dozens. It shouldn't be surprising then that the end of the war saw humanity drastically militarized. However, not only did the UNSC rebuild lost ships, it dramatically improved its space force, modernizing starship design while integrating adapted Covenant and Forerunner technology. Today, we'll cover the post-war ships of humanity. Now, it should be noted noted that some of the vessels on this list may have begun design or construction in late 2552, before the formal end of the war, and this includes the UNSC Infinity, the Strident class frigate, but I will nonetheless include them if they were more widely introduced after the Battle of Earth. And let's start with the Infinity. The UNSC Infinity is humanity's most powerful ship perhaps by a whole order of magnitude, and is currently the deadliest active non-forerunner ship in the galaxy. It has an unparalleled offensive ability, with four super Mac cannons, each of which is capable of punching through a Covenant supercruiser. It was fully shielded, possessed an advanced slip space drive, and served as the mobile training center for the Spartan 4 program. The Infinity Supercarrier line was, at one point at least, plan to include more than one ship, and I've covered the Infinity sister ship, the UNSC Eternity, in a prior video. However, it seems like no other Infinity supercarriers were finished before the events of Halo 5. Whether other ships of the line exist in some form, or are at least planned, is unknown. One notable aspect of the Infinity was its ability to carry smaller frigates into battle. Initially, it carried 10 stalwart frigates, but at least some of those were switched out for onless frigates. The stalwart may have seen some action during the Human Covenant War, but I think it's unlikely. It was the more advanced of the two frigates in my opinion, near 600 meters long, possessing energy shields, and built around a central mech cannon. The Analyst, on the other hand, surprisingly, does not use an integrated mech, but instead relies on Covenant-style energy weapons. A blurb on Halo Waypoint explains that the Analyst may be more effective in atmosphere, perhaps explaining why the Infinity switched its loadout. Regardless, the two ships were meant to replace older UNSC frigates and are being produced in the hundreds. But let's move on. During Halo 4, we see Earth's defenses up close, as the Didact attacks the planet in the Mantle's approach. There, we see two brand new ships, the Poseidon Light Carrier and the Vindication Battleship. We know almost nothing about these two vessels, as they were annoyingly not included in Halo Warfleet, but they are certainly uniquely designed, not really matching conventional UNSC design aesthetics. There's not much else to say other than that their names make their roles very clear. Technically, the Vindication has been retconned, quite strangely I might add, as an old UNSC design, but that makes almost no sense to me. As I said, aesthetically it looks nothing like classic UNSC ships, and exactly like post-war ships, and it's also stationed at Earth during Halo 4. The home fleet would most definitely be comprised of cutting-edge new ships, so I really just don't accept that piece of lore. But that's a bit of a tangent. Probably my favorite post-war UNSC ship is the Autumn class. The Pillar of Autumn was a modified Halcyon cruiser, which attempted to make the aging ship type viable during the late stages of the Human Covenant War. The Autumn class honored this, while also incorporating the spirit of the changes, by creating essentially a modernized Halcyon cruiser. And it seems like, to me at least, the new Autumn class is meant to replace the Marathon as the mainline cruiser for the UNSC Navy, and as such, the basic design for the 
ship is constantly upgraded. Nonetheless, the Ottoman included some light energy shielding, advanced heavy MAC cannons, and a sophisticated sensor and systems package. The lead ship of the class is the Pillar of Autumn II. Finally, we have the Winter Prowler. The UNSC used a variety of prowlers before, during, and after the Covenant War. Prowlers are essentially small, stealth-focused capital ships. The Winter Prowler was an extremely advanced post-war design, fitted with a special slip space drive, allowing it to monitor and report on the activity of aliens and humans even in the most distant parts of the galaxy. The Winter was also equipped with active camo fields adapted from Covenant technology. The Winter and the equipment within was top secret, and the vessel was usually operated by members of Oni. Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter, hello and welcome to another Halo lore video, and today we'll be doing one of my favorite things, talking about capital ships, and specifically one capital ship that I think the UNSC really could have used. But first, before we look into specifics, there are some realities of space combat during the Human Covenant War that we need to address. First of all, the UNSC almost always lost to the Covenant. The Covenant just had more numbers and better technology. What's more, even despite relatively thick armor on UNSC capital ships, most times a vessel would be destroyed by a single shot of a Covenant energy weapon. On that note, unlike the Covenant, the UNSC relied primarily on magnetically accelerated projectiles as well as more standard ordnance to inflict damage as opposed to the aforementioned energy weapons. Speaking of magnetically accelerated projectiles, that brings us to the MAC, a pretty incredible but simple weapon. Basically a slug is accelerated to extreme speeds and slammed into an enemy. The larger ship base max could cut through most Covenant cruisers or at least challenge their shields, while orbital defense platforms could one-shot almost any enemy ship in existence. On that note, it seems like the power of the accelerated projectile essentially scales up with the size of the vessel and probably the amount of power available. Max were often aided or fired by AI, and as we see in Halo 2, Cortana could control an orbital defense platform's MAC independently. Although UNSC capital ships were not typically equipped with Cortana-level AI, dumb artificial intelligences were capable of performing specialized functions and could not only stand in for humans but actually improve on their performance. Alongside AI, larger UNSC vessels like the 1.2 kilometer long Marathon were crewed by over a thousand souls and also extremely expensive to make and thus valuable as the war progressed. I think based on the features of the UNSC Navy that I've highlighted so far, some of you may have guessed where I'm heading with my created ship. But basically, my idea is that the UNSC should have created a line of extremely stripped down capital ships. Ships that were more so, even than say a UNSC frigate, essentially just a floating Mach tube. I'm talking a long and slender vessel, without any real armor, without crew quarters, without missiles or point defense cannons, and certainly without the ability to transport cargo. A ship that is probably longer than even a marathon cruiser, but which is much, much less massive. Most of the ship would have been a barrel, and any important systems probably would be centralized near the rear. That includes reserve ammunition, and of course, any necessary engine systems. The genesis of the idea was such. Given that humanity was weak on both resources and manpower, this ship allows them to save on the cost of ship armor, weapon systems, electronics, and whatever else, while also creating a vessel which would be significantly undermanned compared to a comparably long cruiser. Ideally, a specialized AI would control all features of the vessel, but if necessary, we would also include a very small skeleton crew, I'm talking under a dozen persons. The point is, we're creating something that's disposable from both a morale and ethical standpoint standpoint as well as a resource standpoint. However, in doing so, I'm also trying to maintain what I see as by far the most useful aspect of a UNSC vessel, its MAC cannon. And as I alluded to before, UNSC ships were already built around this axial gun, but again, this is meant to be even more stripped down, with no attempt to carry troops, fighters, vehicles, or anything else. Even UNSC frigates have significant storage space, and the 
removal of this would hopefully represent significant cost and space savings. Obviously this is basically a glass cannon, a ship meant to operate at range, probably with a mid-powered Mac. My hope is that making the vessel longer somehow allows the Mac gun to be more effective, but I don't know whether the science works out there. Either way, it would have the power of at least a comparably long vessel without the similar bulk and cost. While these ships are fighting away from range, the larger vessels would hopefully be performing the bulk of up-close combat. Now, there's still a lot of issues here, and the main thing that drew me to creating this ship is the recognition that basically everything in the UNS is a glass cannon, but just pretends it's not. So although we can't fix the doctrinal issues of the UNSC, which to be fair were caused by the fact that they're facing an almost comically more powerful foe, we can try to work within the existing confines, focus on what works, while trying to eliminate as many weaknesses as possible. Any extra space and power available on this vessel would be given to oversized lateral thrusters so that the ships could hopefully avoid enemy fire while continually firing rounds. Nonetheless, whenever these ships are in battle, there's definitely a potential for serious losses. They have no point defense, they're so under-armored that most enemy munitions will destroy them in one or two shots, and just generally, they're only really effective in cases where they can pick away at the enemy. That's why, if the Covenant jumped in close range, these capital ships would be encouraged to run, live, and fight another day. Of course, it would be a very difficult decision to not take survivors with you or to launch fighters before retreat, but those lessened capabilities are the requirements of such a heavily specialized vehicle. And I can really see these glass cannons working best in group, perhaps even with some sort of central hub ship. This vessel wouldn't really be armed, but would carry long range probes so that the vehicles could be effective at range, they would have extra central processing power for the onboard AI, and maybe they would even carry some starfighters. The idea would be to coordinate fire amongst sniper ships so that one vessel could chew away at Covenant shields while the other would lay into the now vulnerable hull. While I do think this could work, I am making some assumptions and there's some hopes that I think are also necessary necessary if we're going to assume that these vessels will be effective. First of all, I'm assuming that the Mac is not, by far at least, the most expensive portion of a UNSC ship, and that by skimping on armor, weaponry, fighter carrying, and cargo systems, that we will be saving a significant amount of money. I'm further assuming that a long and slender Mac could still generate enough power to be effective at range and deadly. Again, we're not looking for a super Mac or anything like that, but we should be at least in cruiser terror. I'm also assuming that onboard ship AI could perform the majority, if not totality, of the ship's function, and that if any crew is needed, it could be kept under a dozen or so persons. So there's a few benefits here. I think one is the focus on range, which well suits the UNSC. I'm hoping that when combined with the drones, AI, and central processing unit available from the hub ship, that these would be situated to fill a unique role. This also means that these sniper ships will be much more useful useful on the offensive, where the UNSC is more capable of dictating combat ranges, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, know where the ships are needed, retreat otherwise. I also think that these ships would be easier to manufacture, just because there are less parts, and of course if one is blown up, we have less resources gone, and less lives lost. Generally we know the UNSC also put cheap ships directly into harm's way, as frigates had low powered and presumably low range mass. This essentially just offers another type of strategy while maintaining the UNSC's use of wolf pack tactics and overwhelming numbers, at least when they could get them. There are, however, some weaknesses, which I would be remiss not to recognize. First off, the UNSC often used Macs and torpedoes or other weapons in combination. The Macs would weaken shields, while secondary weapons would land the killing blow. I hope we could address this by always having these ships part of a greater mixed fleet fleet and by coordinating fire, but it's still worth mentioning. Some sources have also put the longest covenant ranged weapons
happens at hundreds of thousands of kilometers and it would be difficult to hit anything at that range with conventionally fired projectiles, even with a Mac cannon. And that's just because of the sheer distance and the fact that an enemy can avoid a projectile if it's going to be in transit for several seconds or even a minute or two. That being said, I do think these could generally outrange Covenant capital ships just due to the inherent nature of projectile weaponry and the fact that the UNSC more heavily used AI. But all in all, we have to remember that the UNSC is still at a tremendous technological disadvantage. And I'm not saying this one ship could win the war or sway every battle in the UNSC's favor. Rather, it's a way to make use of the very limited resources in what I consider to be a logical way. All right, so today we'll be talking about the UNSC Infinity and the one area where it has a bit of a deficit. What area is that, you might be wondering? Well, its name. The UNSC, the United Nations Space Command, is known for a navy filled with ships with interesting names. I mean, let's just look at some of the main UNSC ships that are present during the campaigns. We have the Pillar of Autumn, the Amberclad, and the Ford on Dawn. In my opinion, all of these are S-tier ship names. But I mean, that's just really a taste of it because we get a lot more in the Expanded Universe. I posted on Twitter about some of my favorites, and I will include the UNSC 2 for flinching, the UNSC Say My Name, the UNSC All Under Heaven, the UNSC Everest, and of course, the UNSC Spirit of Fire. Human ships throughout Halo lore really walk this fine line between being poetic but not being cheesy. Because yeah, all of these ships in a way embody some element of humanity. When you talk about, say, the UNSC 2 for flinching, the UNSC Say My Name, your ships are embodying the sort of rugged and tough aspect of humanity, which is definitely appropriate for warships. You also have many named off historic events, like the Thermopylae or the Agincourt, or even something like the Lance Held High. Then again, we had, as I said, the more sort of poetically named ships. My favorite of those is probably the Spirit of Fire. It's just a phenomenal name for an exploration slash colony vessel. But the other ships I mentioned in Amberclad, Pillar of Autumn and Forward Under Dawn, all sort of have a hopefulness and a proudness to them that I love. That brings us to the UNSC Infinity. A lot of the aforementioned discussion actually happened on Twitter. I was talking to you guys about your favorite UNSC ship names, and Chris Reagan pointed out that the Infinity is really a terribly generically named ship standing among greats. And yeah, he's 100% right. Infinity doesn't really mean anything. It's a concept, but it doesn't relate to the ship itself. And that kind of got me thinking, what's a better name for the UNSC Infinity? And and I think to name a ship, especially if we want the name to be meaningful, we have to understand what that ship does, what its history is, and maybe even what its purpose is. So the UNSC Infinity. A lot of us know, of course, that it is arguably the most powerful warship ever created by humanity or the Covenant. The Infinity was created with advanced reverse engineered Forerunner and Covenant technology and is a dominant force in the galaxy, not only capable of carrying pretty much any space battle, but also wielding an entire army of Spartan force. The Infinity is not only a new warship, but it represents a new era for humanity, one where humans are no longer on the back foot, one where they can finally stand tall amongst the Covenant and other factions within the galaxy. However, that wasn't always the Infinity. Infinity's purpose, and the ship actually had a much, I guess, grimmer start. Let me read from Halo Warfleet. The vast quantity of resources needed for its construction pushed Earth to its limit during the Covenant War, draining resources and personnel that would otherwise have been used in defense of the colonies. However, Infinity served a larger mission that justified its sacrifice, a potential lifeboat for the human species if the alien empire could not be stopped. So Infinity could have been, or at least was envisioned as possibly, the last bastion of humanity in the entire universe. The last remnant of our proud history after being forced to run and abandon our home, Earth. So I think if you take either that point of view or the idea that the Infinity is now allowing humanity to be the dominant force within the galaxy, we can get two sort of cool streams for naming. Alright, so I want to talk about some of my ideas, and these first names are ones that would suit the Infinity in its role as a last lifeboat for humanity, but also as a symbol of their 
pre-war power. First of all, we have the UNSC pale blue dot. That of course comes from Carl Sagan's famous monologue where he laments the size of Earth and our system in the scale of the universe. I think that would be very appropriate for an emerging, more powerful human faction. We also have the UNSC one small step. This one might be my favorite because it recognizes humanity's origins as a spacefaring species while also sort of playing double feature to the fact that this ship is a small step towards something much greater. One of my other thoughts was that given the fact that the Infinity was finished after the war, it could be cool for the ship to pay respects for some of humanity's losses to the Covenant. So my third suggestion was the UNSC Enduring Reach. Again, sort of a double meaning. Reach, of course, was humanity's greatest colony. The memory of Reach was often invoked in the late stages of the Human Covenant War, and of course, the memory of that will literally be enduring with this ship. But this new ship would also allow humanity to reach new heights as a species, so enduring Reach, I think, fits in that point of view as well. Those are my three main ideas. I definitely like the latter two the most, although I don't think Pale Blue Dot is too bad either. You can also go in the direction where, instead of recognizing history, you focus on human supremacy. So humanity, as mentioned, is off its heels for the first time. The ship could definitely represent that. I think something like Spirit of Fire, which of course is already a Taken ship, is a perfect name for that type of idea. But with all that being said, I put the question out on Twitter and people were discussing it anyway, so I thought it'd be interesting to look at some of the suggestions that I liked that came from you guys. And Sierra had two that I really liked, including the UNSC Manifest Destiny. I like the idea. It may be a little bit too American though, Manifest Destiny is a kind of American ideal, but perhaps that could be expanded to the totality of Earth and its colonies. They also had the suggestion, which I really like, UNSC Trial by Fire or UNSC Trial by Combat, both of which I think are really appropriate given what humanity just went through. Grockle had the UNSC Saving Grace, which I also really like. The no fun and non-fungible put the UNSC Here Be Dragons. I definitely like that idea for a dedicated exploration ship, which arguably the Infinity could have been, but I just thought it was worth pointing out and mentioning. Ling had the UNSC Third from Seoul, which I like as a normal battleship. It's probably a bit too Earth-centric for something representing all of humanity, like the Infinity, but still very, very cool. Another from the Game Jockey that I quite liked, representing the last ditch effort to save humanity, was UNSC That Good Night, after of course Don't Go Quietly into That Good Night. Alex G suggested the UNSC Air to Atlas, which I think works really well from a bunch of different perspectives. And of course, we got lots of other suggestions. Oh, All right, so let's talk UNSC capital ships. Most of you, if you're watching this video, probably already know that after the end of the Human Covenant War, the UNSC began to incorporate Covenant and even Forerunner technology in their ship designs, leading to substantial technological improvement. But not only was the UNSC upgrade their ships, they were also replacing them. By the end of the Human Covenant War, the UNSC had literally a handful of large vessels. Halo War Fleet explains explicitly that in the post-war period, the UNSC Navy is pumping out Shrident and Endless class frigates at Mars and Tribute, and although the UNSC would have been building some ships during the war, their production capacity in the years prior to Halo Infinite probably would have been several orders of magnitude higher due to the fact that humanity was not on the brink of destruction. Let's actually start our discussion today by talking about frigates, and we've actually seen a new UNSC frigate type in Halo Infinite's multiplayer, although this looks like a classic Bungie era Halo 1 to 3 style frigate. It's my belief that this is actually a new class. There are significant differences between this frigate and ships we've seen in the past, as I covered in a prior video examining it specifically. There even seems to be some evidence that this frigate may have had its Mac cannon enhanced by Forerunner or Covenant technology. Maybe that's what the sort of crazy charge up is indicating. Anyway, aside from this as of yet unknown frigate class, we also do have the Strident and the Analyst, as I just mentioned. These two classes were most famously known for being the Infinity these escort ships, the one that literally deploy from its underbelly. The Strident is a real technological achievement. It's got a super heavy Mac comparable to a destroyer or even a cruiser, which is pretty impressive given its relatively limited size. The Endless, however, foregoes a Mac entirely for Covenant-style energy weapons. Halo Warfleet actually says specifically that hundreds of these ships were being built in the post 
War period. That being said, I don't think we'll see them in Halo Infinite just because 343 has clearly pivoted back to the bungee style ship art. So I don't think we'll see several frigate types. I think we'll probably just see the one that we've seen already. That being said, moving up now in tonnage, there is one ship that has a classic design, but new lore, which could actually appear in Halo Infinite. That is the Autumn Class Cruiser. And if you're wondering, what's an Autumn Class Cruiser? Well, it's pretty interesting, actually. The Pillar of Autumn, the famous ship from Halo CE, was a heavily modified Halcyon-class cruiser. The Autumn class essentially formalizes those modifications and translates them into a brand new ship class. Some of the Autumns were, like the Pillar of Autumn, converted Halcyons. Others, however, were built new at human shipyards. The Pillar of Autumn itself had some really incredible technologies, which allowed it to survive so long and see so much combat. Presumably, the Autumn class uses most of these as well. First of all, the Pillar of Autumn's honeycomb structure allowed it to sustain a ton of damage and keep fighting. Second, efficient energy recyclers and power generators allowed the Autumn to fire several times without needing to recharge the Mac, which is something most ships certainly of that size could not do. We also know from Warfleet that the new Autumn class has several unique improvements, including light energy shielding, advanced communication and sensor systems, and of course, state-of-the-art weapons. The reason why I think this ship could possibly appear in Halo Infinite is because it's a design that's been established in the post-war era, but it also matches traditional Bungie designs. And of course it does. It's essentially the Pillar of Autumn with a new coat of paint. Then of course, going even further up in tonnage, and I really don't think we'll see anything between Cruiser and this final ship, we have the UNSC Infinity. I don't think we'll see any UNSC heavy carriers. I guess we could perhaps see the Spirit of Fire, which is a Phoenix class vessel. I've considered covering that in a specific video. Let me know if that's something you're interested in, but without going into spoilers for this video, we don't really know the fate of the UNSC Infinity. Will it be active throughout Halo Infinite? Have the Banished got to it? Will it be a lifeboat to get Master Chief off the ring? Who knows? So yeah, those are the human vessels which I think are likely to appear in the game, and just in order of likelihood, the Infinity certainly will. The UNSC frigate type we've seen in multiplayer of course does. I think it's possible we see the Halcyon, and it's less likely that we see the newer post-war UNSC frigates. Now, to be clear, there were other post-war UNSC ship types. I just don't really think we'll see them in the game. Halo 4, however, did give us the Poseidon class light carrier and the Vindication class light battleship, but they're so different in terms of art style, I don't expect to see them in the game. I did, however, see this really cool reimagining of the Vindication by Callum Dante on ArtStation, which I'm going to link down below. It fits closer with traditional UNSC design. I would have been happy had they went with that version of the ship and not the more kind of Transformers version we see in Halo 4. That's pretty much it though for UNSC ships. As an aside regarding the Banished, I keep wanting to say the Covenant, but regarding the Banished and the Forerunners, I think the two factions aesthetically will also be returning to their roots. What does that mean for the Banished? Well, we've seen in multiplayer, of course, that they will most likely be using a CAS class assault carrier, basically the standard large Covenant carrier that we've seen in most of the Halo games. I would also personally be shocked if they didn't have a CCS. Those ships are just ubiquitous, but I also suspect they will have some new ship designs. We've seen that one cruiser, I guess, which circles the ring, and I suspect there are other ships that I can't even really speculate about because they haven't been in the lore yet. The Forerunners may also make an appearance in the capital ship department. I am however going to guess that instead they'll be focusing on Sentinels, maybe some large and new Sentinel classes, but if we do see a Forerunner ship, I'm going to guess because of the Halo Wars connection it would be the Dragoon style Dreadnought, the big one we see in Halo Wars 1. The Forerunner Navy was the most powerful military force in galactic history, comprised of trillions of ships, Sentinels, and space stations. Ironically, the scope and power of the Forerunner military would serve as the basis for their downfall as uncountable Forerunner vessels and assets were hijacked by the Flood and turned against their creators. Unfortunately, we don't know very much about the ships used by the Forerunners. We see the Sojourner Dreadnought first in Halo Wars 2. Of course, the key ship style Dreadnought plays an important role in the original trilogy, and the massive Mantle's approach is featured in Halo 4. That brings us to the topic of today's video, the Fortress class 
class warship. Although there were larger and more powerful single ships within the Forerunner Navy, including the Mantle's Approach, fortresses were the most powerful ship type, i.e. mass-produced ships rather than singular vessels. Even by Forerunner standards, they were described as weapons of immense power. We've never seen an official render of the fortress class, so I asked my friend and fellow content creator EC Henry to work with me to model one. A link to his channel, by the way, is down in the description. The vessels appear only in Greg Bear's Forerunner trilogy. Halo Cryptum gives a good physical description of them. The largest single Forerunner ships of war fortresses were 50 kilometers in length, with a huge hemisphere on the forward end and a mid-level series of layered platforms equipped with launch bays and gun mounts. Below that, a long, weapon-studded tail. At their widest, they were 10 kilometers across and could carry hundreds of thousands of warriors, as well as automated phalanxes. So the fore of the vessel houses the forerunner inside the ship and is really its most notable part. Instead of using an umbrella, high charity style head, we instead chose to integrate the hemisphere within the ship's main structure, as that seems closer to how most forerunner warships are designed. The midsection of the ship was covered with landing platforms and gun emplacements. It's from here that millions of attack and picket ships could be launched and controlled by forerunners aboard the ship. Finally, we have the tail, which held the majority of the fortress's offensive weapons while also possessing secondary launch bays. Based on Cryptum, it seems like most of the time, the ship moves with the hemisphere at the fore, though on one occasion at least, a fortress enters battle tail first, likely in order to maximize firepower. The Forerunners seem to have many fortresses, as they abandoned and more or less forgot the deep reverence over the Sanchayam homeworld after their war against the species. The the fortress was a pre-war design, and by the time of the flood emergence, the vessels were being built up to twice as long, with far more advanced and destructive weapons. A fully weaponized fortress class was an incredibly effective battleship, starfighter carrier, and just general transport ship. In Silentium, we see Forerunner fleets made up of dozens of fortresses, and at least 75 of these massive vessels, escorted by hundreds of thousands of smaller ships, attempted and failed to defend the Greater Ark from the Flood. Due to the size of fortresses and the size of the Forerunner Empire, a space-time effect known as Reconciliation, which could slow slip space travel, meant that fleets were often broke up, with individual ships traveling alone in order to lessen the strain on galaxy-wide slip space. And that's all we know. The fortresses were massive tools of war, and the most powerful ship line used by the Forerunner. A DeviantArt user known as Darkstorm 99 created a size chart which shows just how massive these vessels were. Now of course, like my design, his fortress class isn't canon, but I think it gives an interesting perspective. Anyway, today we'll be talking about what is arguably, or I would almost say definitively, the most deadly military asset in Covenant history, the Fleet of Particular Justice. The Fleet of Particular Justice was, for much of its history, led by Supreme Commander Thel Vanamy, who many of you know as the Arbiter. The Fleet of Particular Justice was not only one of the largest Covenant fleets in history, but, as I mentioned earlier, almost certainly the deadliest. Not only that, but perhaps more than any other single Covenant force, the Fleet of Particular Justice affected the actions of Master Chief and thus helped to determine the fate of the galaxy itself. Let's talk about the games. In Halo Reach, the Fleet of Particular Justice joined the massive Covenant force which assaulted and eventually glassed the planet of Reach. It was Thel Vatami in Particular Justice which then pursued the UNSC Pillar of Autumn to the Halo Ring Installation 04 in Halo CE, and it was ships of that fleet which hunted Master Chief, fought against UNSC ground forces as we see in Halo the Flood, and of course struggled to stop the Flood Parasite from leaving the ring with one of their captured cruisers and dooming the galaxy. We then see in Halo 2 and 3 that the actions of Thel Vatami and his fleet would indirectly directly lead to the Covenant Schism and the end of the Human Covenant War. But in fact, what we see in the games is only a small part of the fleet of Particular Justice's much larger and storied history. Particular
particular justice was founded sometime during or before 2535 and was placed under the command of Vatemi. According to a report by then Lieutenant Commander Jameson Locke, the fleet of particular justice would be responsible through a combination of incredible naval tactics, ferocious ground assaults, and relentless glassing, the killing of over one billion humans, the loss of over 123 UNSC combat ships, and the outright destruction of at least seven planets. All of this without ever losing a single battle. Even from the Force's opening moments, Vatame was absolutely dominant, and as such, the Prophets rewarded his success with more military assets, and eventually the fleet of particular justice would swell to at least 60 capital ships. Vatame was unpredictable and undefeatable by both conventional and special means in space or on the ground. Arguably, particular Justice's only notable loss of ships, at least that we know of, was during Halo CE, when the Pillar of Autumn, piloted by Cortana, managed to destroy at least four of its cruisers. Particular Justice was so effective that in Locke's aforementioned report, UNSC AI had calculated that the UNSC had a 0% chance of destroying the fleet. It was literally unstoppable, with Jameson Locke of the opinion that it was the single most deadly Covenant asset in existence. Jameson credited particular Justice's success not only to the technological superiority of Covenant capital ships, but also the fact that unlike many Covenant commanders, Vatame was not strategically inflexible, and he wasn't predictable. Alone, the fleet was literally an existential threat to humanity. With the destruction of the Halo Rings, and Thel's subsequent shaming and transformation into the Arbiter, it's unclear what happened to the fleet of Particular Justice. On one hand, Particular Justice represented a lot of assets, and because of the unit's prior success, I can see why maybe a Prophet or other commander would want to incorporate the fleet into a pre-existing naval group. However, there was also the tainting of the Arbiter's so-called heresy. Would that be enough to justify just totally excluding the ships, maybe having them destroyed or having the commanders transferred elsewhere? I'm not sure, and I don't necessarily think it matters. We'll get to more of this in just a second, but if you look at both Jameson's report and realistically how powerful particular justice was compared to the overall Covenant Navy, it wasn't the ships that made the fleet special, it was Vatame's leadership. The fleet at Reach had hundreds of ships, as did the fleet protecting High Charity. The Covenant drastically, by perhaps two or three orders of magnitude, already overpowered the space forces of the UNSC. Getting a lot of powerful ships in one place isn't on its own noteworthy. It was the fact that Vatame himself as Supreme Commander earned this honor, and with him a heretic, I just don't know what happens to the fleet. Anyway, when we look at ship types within the fleet of particular justice, the most powerful vessel employed was the CAS class assault carrier, of which at the fleet's height, there was at the very least four of these ships. A single CAS at five kilometers long and with fully powered shield and several energy projectors is alone more powerful than most human battle groups, especially by the war's end. The only real threat to the CAS would have been some of the ultra heavy UNSC ships and more realistically, Super Mac platforms, which we do know Vatimi was capable of evading and which were also susceptible to fighter swarms. The bulk of particular Justice's firepower would have come from, most likely at its height, at least several dozen CCS-class cruisers. In addition, the fleet would have made use of several smaller specialized and support ships. The fleet composition of particular Justice makes it perfect for a variety of tasks, including outright space warfare, glassing operations, especially if they do have multiple CAS cruisers, and even sustaining entire planetary ground invasions. The most well-known ship within the fleet would have been the Truth and Reconciliation, mostly because it did house the captured Captain Keys, and later an early grave mine during the events of Halo CE, while the fleet's formal flagship was the CAS assault carrier Seeker of Truth. If you're wondering, every Covenant capital ship that you see or hear reference to in Halo CE belongs to the fleet of particular justice. Unfortunately, they are fairly hard to track down after the first game, again leading to the overall confusion of what happened to particular justice and its ships. 
So let's get started with this classic UNSC style frigate which appears in two of the big team battle maps, specifically on high power and deadlock. Unfortunately, the frigate doesn't show up in the theater mode for high power. It does on deadlock though, so we get some really nice shots of it. I assume that's because it's a part of the skybox on this map. And the cool thing is the frigates are actually involved somewhat in the game. When you capture the flag on deadlock, the frigate fires its cannon, which we'll talk about in a second, at the Covenant capital ship, which we'll also talk about in a second, and on deadlock the banished AA fires at the frigate so very cool scenes interestingly it's unclear if they're the same vessel one of them has the UNSC nameplate Panama the other one is unnamed but these are actually completely new frigate classes or at least they don't match any of the main UNSC named frigate subtypes that we know of it's kind of hard to do a critical analysis of a UNSC ship because they're so blocky and the details sort of run together so I'll be pretty simplistic with my explanation the the engines on the ship remind me a lot of a UNSC Paris type. However, while there's a sort of like armor shielding to either side of the engine, the actual engine block itself does look a little bit smaller on this vessel. You can compare that with, for example, the stalwart class, which you can see has a completely different engine block. It could be perspective, but the ship itself also does look elongated compared to standard UNSC frigates. And these little sections on either side of the main body are also, I think, smaller. Now, all of this could be artistic, but to me, the ship is definitely skinnier than either a Paris or a Karen class. But admittedly, that could just be how it's translating, how the model is translating to this gameplay perspective or it could just be slight artistic differences i mean there's no question that 343 has changed the look of frigates before far far more drastically than this the bridge is also further up on this ship and there's enough little changes to suggest to me that this is probably a new vessel type and this is also probably the same ship that we've seen crashed spoiler alert on Halo in the previous campaign demos, just briefly from overhead shots. If I were to guess, I think this is probably a post-war ship. One of the main things that I've seen people talking about is this Mac shot that we see it fire off in multiplayer. Now this does look different than the Macs we see in Halo 3 or Halo Reach, but I do think that is what they're intending to show here. In prior games, the Mac is contained either on the upper or the lower boon, depending on the frigate model. In this case, obviously it comes from in between the two parts of the ship. To be fair, that could indicate that it is a different weapon, but I think that's just a different choice and it kind of makes sense. It looks almost like an accelerator or a railgun. I don't, however, think it's an energy weapon. I've seen a lot of people guess that this could be some post-war UNSC weapon that they've reverse engineered from the Forerunners or the Covenant. That is definitely possible, especially if this is meant to be a next generation frigate. I think, however, this is just how 343 shows Mac shots. We saw that in Halo 4 didn't really look traditionally like a Mac, it looked more like an energy beam, but that's kind of just what they're going for. Interestingly, I did see Chris from Halopedia tie this to a previously unknown vessel, specifically in this shot right here. You can see a UNSC frigate type. It's quite distinct. It's got double engines on each side. It's got that sort of shielding next to the engines, almost like the Paris does, and it does seem to have a somewhat diminutive midsection. Halopedia actually ties this to the UNSC Nevada, which is a fan-made ship by Calamity SI, who we've actually talked about on this channel before in reference to stolen fan art. I don't think that's what's going on here, but I definitely do see the similarities, especially in those kind of offshoot midsections and the engine blocks, but who knows really. Either way, like I said, I think this is supposed to be a post-war ship. I also think that the ship in both cases is intended to be the same vessel. If you look, the UNSC logo is actually flipped on the map where you can read it. I think it's probably just a thing where the ship in one case is close enough that it's kind of cool to be able to read it, while in the other case it's baked into the background and it's dark. Anyway, I've never been great at identifying UNSC frigates, so what do you think? Let me know which frigate subtype is this or is it something new? Do you agree with me when I say it's probably a post-war ship? Let me know all of that and more down in the comment section. All right, this is Future Eck just chiming in. We're about to talk about the Covenant Cruiser and I saw some interesting information on Twitter actually as I was browsing while the video was exporting that I thought was worth including. Someone named Jared Harris who works on the excellent Sins of a Solar Empire mod Sins of the Prophets noticed that the CAS Assault Carrier, and this is a quote from the tweet, seen in the infinite map, seen
seems to be a composite of the Sins of the Prophet CAS that I modeled and textured a while ago. This would be absolutely crazy cool if true. What do you guys think? And looking at the pictures, it does seem like it is actually the same model. I assume that this was the Halo 3 model, maybe fixed up and prettied up for the new game, but pretty much all the details align. This isn't the first time that 343 has used Sins of the Prophet stuff. I know that they worked together on some stuff for the encyclopedia. Just thought that was worth mentioning. If there's more to talk about on this topic later, well, we'll talk about it. We do also have a Covenant capital ship. Now, this is very clearly some sort of Covenant carrier. It matches the CSO or CAS classes quite well. The scale points to it being a CAS class vessel, but beyond that, I couldn't really identify a whole whole lot. If you zoom in, however, you can see that it does have a visible energy projector on that front hook of the vessel. Some Covenant assault carriers don't. Covenant ships can sometimes be classified based on their design, with ships having different patterns. Usually the one with the energy projector at the front here is called a Carol pattern, same type that you see in Halo 3. Does that mean this is the shadow of intent? Yes, absolutely. Expect the Arbiter in the game 1000%. No, I'm just joking. It's probably a new ship. Nice details though, I'm glad they've returned to the classic ship designs and that they've actually included the Covenant carriers because in Halo 4 and 5 they usually relied on the smaller CCS class ships so this is pretty cool. We do also see the energy shield flare up when the Mac round is fired at it that's a nice detail but that's about as much as I can analyze two immobile ships from multiplayer maps. I'll talk a little bit about the UNSC Infinity now and other vessels that we may expect to see in the game so spoiler alert if you don't want to know anything about Halo Infinite going in and I'm also going to talk about the first I think it's half an hour or so of the game as it's described in some of the interviews that have come out and some people do consider those spoilers so consider clicking away this is your last warning all right so the UNSC Infinity according to Game Informer Halo Infinite starts with again spoiler alert the UNSC Infinity in a space battle with a banished warship where something happens to it and it crashes we do also see some interior shots of the banished warship I'm I'm going to guess it's this vessel that we've seen a few times in Halo Infinite screenshots and also in the main menu. Way back when, people thought this was a part of the ring, but you know, I talk about spaceships for a living, I could tell this was a banished capital ship. I think we're going to be able to go there pretty freely. It might almost act like a place on the map, which would be pretty cool. What's going to happen to the Infinity though? Well, I don't think it's going to be dead for good. The Infinity has crashed before, it will crash again. This is sort of a very common theme with human ships in Halo, especially if Master Chief needs a reason to be stranded on the ring. My argument for what they should do, for what would be awesome, is that they should have the Infinity be slowly repaired throughout the game, and then by the end, you sort of bring in the last pieces to fix it, and that opens up the Infinity to now returning to space travel. We know that Halo Infinite is going to have more campaigns in the future. Maybe the way that you travel to these other campaigns and bring things with you, your resources that you've collected or whatever else, is through the UNSC Infinity. That would also sort of provide a rationale for the new multiplayer maps or whatever else they're adding. They seem to be trying to keep that pretty lore accurate. Just a thought there. I hope you guys enjoyed this video though. Until next time, be safe, have a good one, and may the force be with you.